saved you. And I'm here to save you again. The parasites are merely a symptom of a greater sickness in Faerun. The infected hear the voice of the Absolute and believe it to be a god. The Absolute is more dangerous than you can possibly conceive. It threatens all who live. It threatens the gods, the weave, the very fabric of the universe itself. How would you feel about helping me kill some evil bastards? Lackith blesses me this day. Together, we might survive. I'll enjoy watching you try. In mere moments, all that you have dreaded will come to pass. When the screaming stops and your mind is gone, the rest, perhaps, is... Silence. Dungeons & Dragons has been a staple part of the role-playing community for a long time. It's older than me as a hobby. Countless spin-offs and new concepts in the genre have grown over the years, but none have remained as popular as D&D. I was introduced to the game with 3rd edition, and shortly thereafter, 3.5, 4th edition came and went, and for almost a decade we've been playing Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Simple to learn, difficult to master, and with a like-minded group of players, infinitely amusing or just the same abhorrently terrifying. Beyond all the mechanical depth and complexity lies the true appeal to role-playing games, the boundless choices and decisions you can make to create your unique adventure, your own story. Through these simple systems we learned that the game itself was only a medium to tell your tale. That it didn't have to be Dungeons and Dragons, but it could be other games like World of Darkness, Changeling the Lost, Vampire the Masquerade, Defiant, and a personal favorite of mine, Monster Hearts. The game supplemented the adventure, provided limitations you work through to tell a narrative of intrigue and struggle. The game gives you a state of failure and provides a sense of true consequence when the right people are involved, especially the right Game Master. The Game Master leads the story, weaves your choices and their own narrative together, and their human empathy, sympathy, and overall vibe work with you to create the enjoyable experience, be it joyful, tearful, or full of anger and rage. It is the Game Master, or GM for short, that video games have tried and failed to emulate for a long, long time. While MUDs, or multi-user dungeons, have ruled the scene on computer role-playing game for years, truly mainstream appeal was yet to occur. 1998, though, was Baldur's Gate. And that game created a model we'd follow for a long, long time. It is imperative that you make your way to the friendly arm in. Bio goes as clean as an elven arm. Truly immersive Dungeons and Dragons, though it was AD&D and... Mm, 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 no, mm, no, mm, mm, get that away, get, 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 get it away from me. Truly immersive D&D was playable right in front of us, be it alone or with a group of other adventurers over a local area network. You created a character and were thrust into the Sword Coast, a region in the land of Faerun, which was an official setting from the Dungeons and Dragons modules. You could pick your race, your class, your appearance, your alignment. You could multi-class, roll your abilities, and make your protagonist shine. It is a tale of growth. You begin as a low first level character and very carefully navigate the unknown. From a basement of rats and barracks hiding an assassin to the underground caves of kobolds and forests filled with bears. 
but we uh, we don't we don't talk about the Bears, please. Not again. You are an apprentice to your master, Gorion. A day like any other dawns, but your master is impatient and eager to move on. You are given some gold and told to prepare. You can equip yourself with some necessities, perhaps a potion or a weapon. You wander your once home and define some basics that are your character. Were you a bad child being raised? Were you a good kid? Were you thrifty? Or did you have your head in the clouds? These choices were mostly flavor, but they set the tone. You had the reins on this character. You set the expectation on how they'd run through their journey. It was a fantastic experience, one I completed last year for the first time. I enjoyed the novelty of old school AD&D, though I'd be okay with never dealing with Thacko ever again. It is a system that is needlessly complicated to learn, even if it's as simple as execution. But, the Game Master is the game itself, and the game wants you dead. A GM can determine the pace of your adventure. They can make split decisions to harm the party, to spare the party, to reward the party, and if a character is dying they, and they roll a dice to hit, landing a crit, the GM can look at the table, check morale, and announce to the party it missed. Baldur's Gate, and subsequently most CRPGs after, intend to kill the player. If the best spell in a wizard's arsenal is Fireball, then you're about to be Cinders. The AI, especially early on in video game development, is ruthless and expects to win. You can, in fact, overcome it. Preparation, item management, a selection of spells and abilities that the game doesn't know how to react to. All of these are viable strategies. So is turning the difficulty down and taking the GM's punches like a champ. I did that in my playthrough of the original's Baldur's Gate, and I'm not ashamed of it in the slightest. The last third of the game was agonizing. Maybe I suck, but it's irrelevant. I walked away happy enough and would go try it again with the knowledge, with like full knowledge one day. Uh, though... Perhaps our topic of today makes that a little difficult. It is fascinating to watch a game grow and develop over time. Back in 2020, an early access version of Baldur's Gate 3 released from Laren Studios, and it was met with a widespread, huh? I mean, I was in the same boat. Divinity Original Sin and its sequel released standalone and were huge successes. What about this game would be so different? On the surface, especially early on in development, the game looked identical to Divinity Original Sin 2. Couple the confusion with the fact that it was early access and incredibly buggy and in truth, many people were turned off by the game, myself included. Early access has a bad vibe behind it. Many projects go here to die, but take some of our money with it. Would Baldur's Gate 3 suffer the same? For three years, eager backers watched the game mold and grow. Combat got tighter, animation smoother, levels got finished, and more and more choices were added to each encounter. For three years, not a single soul saw past Act 1 of Baldur's Gate 3. Goblins, druids, tieflings, owlbears, bandits, that good boy scratch, and the ever-present and looming threat of the Mind Flayers were all we had available. It was the story we could start and never finish. For three years, the game had its niche and quietly enhanced itself in the background, hidden away from prying eyes of media and eager mainstream players. Yet a month from its release, a live stream was hosted. Influencers of all levels and fame were invited to attend an event discussing the game. Questions were asked on how Baldur's Gate 3 would live up to the legacy. How many choices existed that truly mattered? How balanced was the endgame? Plans for expansions or DLC? 
and 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 the bear the bear the bear happened the bear bear the bear happened look i showed that clip to my friend group the entire group laughed at it including myself and then proceeded to call it the game where javi would screw the bear look it's so much more than that for me I had been excited for this game forever, but kept distant from early access or updates so that I could experience my first playthrough as fresh as possible. Upon release, I was agonized. I've been trying to use my Xbox as my main platform because I've enjoyed achievement hunting and seeing the score go up, but with no release in sight and my hype at its highest, I bought the game on Steam and immediately bought another copy for my wife who was so enthralled by the character customization, she wanted to play it herself. So, how'd the game's launch turn out? Well, within a week of the game, about me screwing a bear, everyone, had, everyone was hooked. And every single person in my group who had no interest immediately grabbed on and haven't let go yet. Baldur's Gate 3 is a massive success. And don't just take my word for it. On Steam alone, Baldur's Gate 3 had achieved over 850,000 concurrent players, breaking records left and right in a gaming ecosystem of microtransactions, DLCs, and rushed deadlines leading to half-finished products. We received a title that reflected none of the modern grime. It is by no means perfect, but it has lived up to its hype and then some. From the word go, Baldur's Gate 3 is an experience all about your character and their choices. The moment the epic and grotesque cinematic ends and a tadpole produced by a mind flayer is injected into you, your journey begins in earnest. Earlier I mentioned that the original's Baldur's Gate followed AD&D rules, but Baldur's Gate 3 follows 5th edition, and it's a fairly faithful adaptation. Your first major decision is to create your own character or role an origin character. The origin characters are the various companions you'd find at the beginning of the game. They have a unique introduction and a set class, though you're not truly limited in the long run. If you make your own character, you have two choices, a traditional custom character or the Dark Urge. The Dark Urge has a past of carnage or destruction, and it's up to you to embrace it or fight it. From there, it's D&D customization. Race, class, ability scores, proficiencies, background, and appearance. This is where one of the shortcomings comes into play. The number of options offered in appearance customization is slim. Despite some people still managing to make some rather outlandish character designs, the goal was to limit appearance customizations to keep a more grounded world. It's a choice in bad faith, honestly. You should let the players create a monstrosity if that's how they want to do it. Because others might make incredibly awe-inspiring designs. I hope in the future it's a decision they rectify and add more customizations to the game. But now you've named yourself, you've reviewed your stats, and you've customized the appearance of a second character simply known as your guardian. Confused and eager, having spent minutes or days in this first daunting task, you start the game and witness a spectacle as realms are revealed, dragons roar, and you fall out of your pot. Like an earlier title, Bastion, players are greeted almost immediately by a disembodied voice that describes the scene around you and consequently describes most every action you take. Much to the likeness of its tabletop origins, Baldur's Gate 3 has a narrator that keenly and succinctly explains and weaves the plot around you. Often interacting with an object will activate a narrative conversation to allow you to manipulate the world around you. Take the writhing corpse in the hall just after you awaken. You hear a high-pitched voice calling to you. Investigating the body, you see a wriggling brain. You have the option to investigate the brain, pull out the brain gently using dexterity, or smash the skull with strength. You can also just leave and not deal with the repercussions of any option. I made a drow rogue, criminal background. So after failing my investigation role, I pulled out the brain. 
but I saw an opportunity. I could hinder the monster to prevent it from hurting me. But I failed that roll and just jammed my thumb into the creature. It ran away, and later I found myself fighting the intellect devourers alongside the other creatures. Another one in my group did the same interaction, but left the brain alone after pulling it out. He gained the creature as a temporary companion that fought alongside him out of the ship. Every action was narrated in those conversations, and likewise, every action was determined by a dice roll. Luck can be an infuriating prospect, often especially in video games. We want things to go our way, especially when it affects the story. I love this aspect as it adds to the replayable nature of the title. There's a setting on by default called Karmic Dice, which sways important decisions or recent bouts of failure in your favor. There was a bug in early access, and it's still being investigated if this affects enemies as well, but all in all, Baldur's Gate 3 can be save scummed. You can save mid-combat and during conversations, meaning if there's a desired outcome, it's not impossible to reach it with enough luck and patience. Moving forward after a tense introduction to a companion, you're introduced to combat. Surprise! It's D&D 5th Edition. Hooray! There are some omissions, like sneak attack for a rogue is very, very forgiving, as in usual instances, advantage is taken away if a player is surrounded, but in Baldur's Gate 3, if two allies are around an enemy, sneak attack is selectable. Each character has a main action, a bonus action, and movement. Each action you take is color-coded. Green is a primary action, so that means things like your main hand attacks, abilities, spells, throwing something, dashing, disengaging, etc. Orange is a bonus action, chugging a quick potion, jumping, offhand attacks, activating a special personal ability like rage, applying poisons, etc. And movement is how far you can move on any given turn. Depending on your class, you'll have access to different orders of operation. A rogue gets cunning action and an additional bonus action, meaning dash, disengage, and hide are considered bonus actions instead of a primary. So I could, in theory, move behind my target, apply a poison to my weapon, cunning action to hide, and then sneak attack as my primary for a large damage burst. Of course, dice rolls are constantly happening in the background, so even the most perfectly executed plan could fail on luck alone. Sometimes it's enough to adapt, sometimes it's time to accept defeat and reload. Save often. Shortly into the game, you'll learn the maximum main party size is four. In rare instances, you may see companions available due to story reasons or summoned creatures, but four is your typical setup. Managing your party, evenly distributing healing, knowing your positioning, proper use of abilities, and a whole lot of luck are required to see the end of this game. I'm playing on balanced and have had a few encounters ruthlessly destroy me. Likewise, I've also decimated the opposition anticlimactically. It's just luck of the dice. A GM in Baldur's Gate 3 is still the same video game GM that tried to kill us all the way back in 1998. It will use its deadliest abilities when it can. It will end you in seconds if it gets the chance. But the difference here comes from the balance of encounters. It's by no means perfect. But often if you're in a right area and prepared, you can survive. Although there is that Laren style of having a spot two feet in the wrong direction kick your ass, following the narrative leads to proper encounters, but an explorer's heart will lead you into trouble. Again, save often. With my party of four in a side quest section, I found this place that was one level higher than me. I was third level, as was my party, and we fought a group that was all fourth level. I clustered my team together, weaving my ranged characters into the open fire, and leaving enough movement so they can duck behind cover when they needed. My main character and other melee went down twice, but we got them back up and healed, and we won the fight just barely. That was a well-earned rest, and I was so pumped and excited. And that's just barely scratching the surface. The game is far too new to go into intense moments of detail just yet, considering 
how much is missable, but it's such a joy to experience the thrills of full combat and to see the breadth of options laid out before you. Nothing is stopping you from using brute force, likewise nothing is stopping you from a four player party of wizards and fireballs. Have fun, go wild. Now the combat and exploration are stellar. I am not denying that. It is a fantastic dungeon crawler. It is a fantastic role-playing game. I have to gush about the narrative. The story and mystery front and center, the different branching paths, the companions, oh my god, the companions. I've dreamed of such perfectly flawed people in my RPGs and games, and they're here, they're real, they're fully realized. So much credit to the scenario writers, the character designers, the voice actors. I want to know every little thing about each one of them. I am a hopeless romantic at heart and have always adored romance in games, but here's the best part, you don't have to be. The characters may shoot their shot, but the romance doesn't have to happen. The backstories don't have to happen. You can be as focused or unfocused as you care to be, and doing so leads to entirely new outcomes. Come on, this game isn't real. Sure, there are memes about characters online, specifically Asterion, but like, I'm glad you're finding the surface funny, honey. But let me tell you, I gotta tell you, stop playing in puddles and dive in, sweetheart. Mm? Look at him. Listen to him. Ah. <coughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Often a branching narrative leaves a sour taste in one's mouth. Either it's the same game with a few minor differences, or it is a different objective and levels are half-baked. It is too early to tell the scope and logical differences available here, and I do think repeat playthroughs on a gameplay side will waver, but the love and care that went into the different reactions a character can give you for some absolutely mundane stuff is perfect. The reactions from companions alone would make repeat playthroughs a joy to experience. I am very sad it is so early in the life of this game as I don't feel comfortable talking spoilers yet. I'm midway through Act 2 and I hear Act 3 is even bigger. I've made dozens of choices, I've had things go wrong, I've had things go right, I've laughed and I've cried. I had a, I've had a paladin criticize my roguish ways, and I'm not kidding, one of my closest friends, we've been talking about Baldur's Gate 3, and every reaction is her going, Javi, and it's wonderful. I have experienced a role-playing game. I have experienced THE role-playing game of 2023. I intend to do a follow-up someday, to capture my thoughts after the hype has settled, to rate this among the greats, but what we have here as a complete and total package defines modern gaming in such a way that makes the industry better. Baldur's Gate 3 is everything I could have hoped for. It is beautiful, it is funny, it is challenging, it is intriguing, it is depressing, it is infuriating, it is Dungeons and Dragons, and it is phenomenal. Now get out of here. Roll those D20s, adventurers. That bear isn't about to fuck itself.